family within her community in relation to colonial Caribbean manners in her small space Caribbean landscape, but also subsequently as a black woman from the Caribbean living in a world which already constructs one in a particular set of narratives, and above all, as a creative artist too. Her response is always to return that gaze, to re-narrativize the experience. She's not waiting for herself to appear, as Fanon does here at the start. She unfolds the self through multiple avenues. I want to suggest that she also embraces this dislocation in much the way that the whole epigraph suggests, but takes it a step further. This presentation then proposes to examine what some of these dislocations and the ability to take space, which is a hallmark of Caribbean cultural self-representation, means in three movements. So King, first of all, Kincaid's rejection of spatial containment. At the end of the magical, at the bottom of the river, there is a wonderfully evocative construction of a world that our author sees or imagines in which nature is alive with beauty and transformation. But there's also a self in which the conjunction of land and sea is transformational. Quote, I looked at this world as it revealed itself to me. How new, how new, and I longed to go there, page 78. Clearly, a refashioning then of that limited world to an imagined world with a parallel quest for an elsewhere, fundamental to diaspora, fundamental to the creative artist. It seems to me, then, this is what typifies the entire journey of Kincaid and, and captures the dissatisfaction she feels with enforced containment to smallness and the ability for many to see or imagine themselves beyond specific localities. Hers, then, is a rejection of spatial confinement and a desire for consistently expanding space, as I also argue, in Caribbean spaces. And I talk a little bit about that whole question. In many ways, then, my work as a scholar of Caribbean origin, who migrated to the US for educational advancement, occupies the same temporal and geographical spaces as this Kincaid. Still, hers is a process, therefore, fully intelligible to me, but also it's an experience of my friends and family as well who've done similar things. And I'm talking about the fact that she comes as an au pair, works, and then begins to be a writer. Coming of age then, as colonialism ended and new nations began to work out themselves in the Caribbean without resources, migration loomed consistently as the pathway to a more advanced life experience. We know from recent works like Hilary Beckles' Britain's Black Depth, Re Reparations of, for Slavery and Native Genocide 2013, that three to 400 years of slavery and extractive colonialism left the Caribbean with little in terms of institutions, infrastructure, and resources, except with the open possibility of migration to Europe for some, to North America for others. As one, we have access to education or getting back some of these economic resources. But we also know that those migrations in either context did not necessarily produce uniformly the promises of a better life or the full belonging that was often assumed on departure so back to that Fanon example, uh, or the Lonely Londoners example from the black, the writers who went to London, or Donald Hines' uh, Journey to an Illusion narrative of the UK. The US then was for hope, more hopeful than it is today. The activism and promise of challenges to racial subordination in that time period that many of us migrated to the US then, ushered in new possibilities ironically being curtailed now. For many of us as well, there's another realization that difficult location of migration then, being displaced from home but also displaced in this new location. This reminds us that this location was, is, we can include, always that parallel experience of diaspora creation. So examining the trajectory of my diaspora and migration discourses in order to situate our discussion, we can say briefly, that while the discourse of diaspora has become a popular academic consideration in the late 20th and 21st century, into the 21st century, the histories of transatlantic slavery and forced migration and the consequent diaspora creation have always remained significantly central to the definitions of black subjectivity in the Americas. Kincaid explores these well in Annie Jaw, 1983, particularly in the section on Columbus in Chains, for which she is, Annie is punished for offering a critique of false discovery, European domination, and coloniality. In other portions of the text, she provides the girl's angle on colonial schooling geared to constructing compliant natives, and clearly she would not be one of those. 
by the time we get to a small place, we are fully into a heightened critique of the entire process of the collaborative exploitation of the Caribbean by a variety of world powers. I developed some of these issues more fully in previous work, but there are two relevant essays I want to identify. One, imperial geographies and Caribbean nationalism at the border between a dying colonialism and US hegemony. This was published in, U in New Centennial Review in 2003. And Migrations, Diasporas, and Nations, the Remaking of Caribbean Identities, 2009. The argument in the latter was that the Caribbean navigates between the longer historical diaspora and the more recent Caribbean diasporas created in pre- and post-independence migrations, and in the former that we are caught between contending colonial imperial impulses. In this context, then, Caribbean political identity have moved consistently towards a critique of that difficult legacy of slavery and its related structural inequalities and the ongoing oppression created by extractive colonialism and its aftermath, which created as well intra-Caribbean migrations and also precipitated new migrations and diasporas. And it's important to say as well here that in Migrations of the, Sublish, of the Subject, published in 1994, um, signal for me the beginning of a certain set of inquiries on migration. Still, it was a theoretical contribution more directly to discourses of subjectivity, arguing that the subject has migratory capability depending on a range of factors, age, race, place, geography, nation, identity, language, and so on. In many ways, Kincaid's work, which up until then included only at the bottom of the river, Annie, John, and Lucy, and a small place, would be highly illustrative of my arguments. Uh, for she definitely is one of the first to offer an intense detailing of the North American angle of migration. And when she does go to England, as in On Seeing England for the first time, it is a scathing critique of all of that hyped and perfect seat of empire that Caribbeans received in their schooling, people of my mother's generation particularly. Much like the character Antoinette Bertha and Jean Rice White Sagasso see, England fell short and was therefore way less than what was created in the colonial imagination. Some call that essay bitter and angry, but for Audre Lorde, as does Kincaid, anger has a particular set of creative uses which clearly she continues to employ. Still, Kincaid never offers an uncritical, unproblemized acceptance of Caribbean identity. In fact, as a small place shows, she rejects almost everything that had negatively shaped this Caribbean home place and its people colonization, corrupt neo-colonial politics, neglect, pettiness. But it is a rejection and hard critique of a critical insider-outsider who sees with an eye for detail the many idiosyncrasies, anomalies, and perversions wrought on a Caribbean slave society and their legacy on today's people. Significantly as well, we have perhaps for the first time the exploration of sexuality in a context in which Caribbean literary masculinity had prevailed for so long. And I'm talking about her descriptions of the red girl and, and series of other places where she actually was very close to talking about same-sex sexuality. But it's sensuous writing in every way and also critical of all those colonial manners and the ways that mothers sought to enforce these as marvelously and succinctly captured in girl. Once migrated though, one sees in the representative Lucy 1990 of 1960s and 70s generation, a critical thinker who can write critically, almost anthropologically, about the white family with which she works as the writer herself moves from au pair girl to writer and becomes in some ways representative of that generation of women who would strike out from the Caribbean, as the character does at the end of Annie John, determined to make a life abroad for themselves. And it is urban and suburban New York sexuality and family life that concern her, tracing the pathway of the Caribbean migrating subject. But here it is important to jump ahead to Talk Stories 2001, because although published later as a group, they represent in microscopic detail what became her hallmark and which would provide detail and set the tone for subsequent writing. Here we see a kind of, again, reverse anthropology in which she studies North American domestic and public life between 1974 and 1983. And it is significant that she begins the first talk story as a study of the Brooklyn Carnival called Labor Day, which she titles West Indian Weekend. And we already know that the exportation of Caribbean carnivals has become one of the prime signifiers in that claiming of expanding Caribbean space. The fact that it's included in the New Yorker and becomes a lead 
uh, piece for that book, Talk Stories, is significant to my argument. Along the way then, in detailing this New York experience for the New Yorker, it's almost like she had a lab at her disposal as she encounters a range of popular culture figures, people like Richard Pryor and others. And we witness this meticulous cataloging of American follies, also waste and excess. She does it too really nicely in those documentations. Interspersed as well throughout is her writing, her own self-writing, an identification of important elements in Caribbean cultural history and manners, the remnants of plantation culture. There's a piece, interestingly, that she wrote called The Ground. Um, this is a, just a reference I, I didn't put up earlier from Hilary Beckel's um, Black Debt, Reparations for Caribbean Genocide and Slavery. Um, Dion Brand, okay. This is the piece I was trying to get to. In that piece called The Ground In, she provides a similar argument as the Sylvia Winter in Provision Grounds, where Winter describes the fundamental way in which black people indigenized in the Caribbean, and it had to do with creating or using the space for cultivation, as, as she does in The Ground. Uh, and she describes it pretty well here. I grew up on the island in the West Indies, and she gives the square footage, small space, right? On the island, there are many sugarcane fields and sugar-making factory, and a factory where both white and dark rum were made, cotton fields, not as many, arrowroot fields, tobacco fields. Um, she continues, I now live, she ends though, I now live, lo live in Manhattan, and the only thing in common with the island where I grew up is a geographical definition. After that, she proceeds to talk, I think it's short-sightedly, about the difference in sleeping hours and the absence of the necessity of most people on this urban island to awake early to make a living from selling produce under difficult farm to market conditions. And I say short sightedly because there are people who get up at five in the morning in Manhattan. We've seen them on the train, right? They're usually the workers who are gonna do the hard labor markets and so on as well. Stuart Hall, as we have indicated, concluded that dislocation and diaspora are fundamental to diaspora. But the same dislocation and disjuncture also marked his experience of being at home. In other words, both embody versions of dislocation, particularly for the non-conforming individual. This is perhaps what Kinky does best. For both Fanon and Hall describe a double or triple dislocation, but also particularly for Hall an assumption of dislocation perhaps, which is fundamental to the modern human condition. Now Sailor James, the Caribbean political theorist, had already argued, um, and he does it really at the end of, of his book on Haiti, The Black Jacobins, where he said that actually the Caribbean was the first to experience this modern condition of displacement and dislocation, and that we actually, therefore, the first sort of modern subjects in that kind of way to experience that. So when Stuart Hall, um, in the end, and I'll go to that next, talks about the fact that, that we live this location and this juncture, and he was living this already in the Caribbean. You can see um, that he's talking also about this location as a hallmark of this modern condition, right? So this is uh, migrations of the subject, uh, where I talk a little bit about that before. My most recent book project uh, defined Caribbean space beyond the limitations. So this is the second section I'm in now, living dislocation and diaspora. <clears throat> defined Caribbean space beyond the limitation to island seas and oceanscapes. It evoked Wilson Harris's The Womb of Space, in which Harris described concentric horizons to talk about space in more advanced ways. I was also fascinated by the idea of circulations of ideas, people, cultural forms, politics, rather than simply diasporic movement from one location to the other, but a series of circulations and a desire from the Caribbean always for global relations or world space. And I think that's the, one of the points that people miss in terms of um, understanding the Caribbean. Uh, there's um, almost every one of the groups would try to engage this in some way. And I, I jokingly have used the Rastafari um, quote um, as one example where they say, you can't expect me to give up a continent and keep an island, right? It's an equal exchange. Um, give up Africa, therefore, and, and locate me in a small island somewhere. But also, the second one is that wherever in the world you go, and there are a lot of jokes, Babaka has one about in, in Alaska you will find Caribbeans and they will have a carnival 
and they'll be, they'll be fighting for <laughs> two carnivals even in that space. But the logic of always um, expanding spaces, and I say this because in, in Caribbean space I talk about this. Um, I went all the way to Australia, the Caribbean Studies Association of Australia to give a talk, and a woman sitting in the back, you know, at the end of the, the, the talk wanted to talk to me, and she said, oh, my name is Pat, I'm from Trinidad, Caranage. We have carnival here. We have I was like, wow. So the, and she talked about the fact that her, her husband, who left before her with his brother to go to Australia, didn't go for any other reason than they wanted to go there. That the idea was, you know, they wanted to see how far they could go. And they went all the way to Australia and ended up living there. So there, besides the necessity then, you know, we talk about the migration and diaspora in interesting ways, but there's voluntary, there's forced, and of course there's induced. The voluntary one is one really fundamental feature of the Caribbean, which is also significantly interesting here. So in other words, the sort of desire for global relations or world space. In other words, the vision was not to me simply Atlanticist as Gilroy had it, but a Caribbean space that is definitely extended beyond the Atlantic, a kind of larger and bonded mobile Caribbean transnation then. Part of that is the assumption of a series of homes, uh, which is suggested for the Caribbean activists, whether it's Claudia Jones, who I worked on, but also for everyday people. Uh, Caribbean identity, according to Dion Brand, has to be one then that has to be ready for continuous reintervention. And this is Brand's point, after the door of no return, a map was only a set of impossibilities, a set of changing locations. A map then is only a life of conversations about a list of forgotten, forgotten list of irretrievable selves, right? Um, so Dion Brand um, makes this point in a different way, and her book is called A Map to the Door of No Return. So the logic of circulations, I argue, captures best the spatially expanding movements of people, ideas, politics, cultural forms that comes from the Carib come from the Caribbean and circulate internationally through a series of global migratory processes which continue throughout the 20th century to create new identities and parallel histories. S these identities, I've argued um, before, move us beyond the theoretics of post-colonialism. Uh, we need, I continue to ask, for new vocabularies that describe the various encounters between the different worlds ushered in by a variety of forces. So what are some of these locations? And interestingly, this is from 1994. I was um, quite pleased that I had already, in at, at that point, already tried to think through this question of location. In the closing chapter to migrations of the subject, I talk about the politics of location actually bringing forward a whole host of identifications and associations around place and placement, location, dislocation, and all of those uh, points that you see indicated here. I won't read the entire thing since up, it's already up there. So diaspora then creates with it always that sense of dislocation or removal from any fixity in a given location. And for those living in the now defined Caribbean diaspora, this double dislocation is captured in the historical but ongoing movement of peoples first from originary geographic and cultural fields, Africa, India, and so on, and then the subsequent economically generated movements to the centers of colonial administrative policy in the British sense, but later in the American context. The distant homeland then, say Africa, or India, or China, recedes further into the realm of ancestral memory and the imaginary. The more recent homeland also, a site of dislocation, is layered onto that meaning. And historians can demonstrate that similar movements have taken place throughout history. Thus, when Hall uses his location in Britain to talk about himself as being diasporically, triply, or doubly moved to comment on this phenomenon, he's actually, in my view, indicating something which we already understand ourselves to be experiencing as colonized subjects, right? Hall says that it's prophetic, and his argument, this is, um, I was just, I love to show this image because it's from another work that I did, Claudia Jones, Left of Karl Marx. Um, and for those of you who know my work on this, on this really important activist, you know she's buried, Left of Marx. Um, and when I talk about the issues of location and dislocation, she represents it in another way because she is deported from London, um, from the US to London, and ends up 
creating the first carnivals, the first newspapers there, but also being buried left of Karl Marx, visibly <laughs> left of Karl Marx. And you have to read the book to get the logic of what I'm working with there, but it's important for me to see that. Anyway, Hall, in his probably one of his maybe final essays, very prophetically says, pretty much the Caribbeans are like the front runners of all of these movements. Notice the end of this quote. The ones driven onto the camps across the borders by famine, civil war, environmental devastation, or pandemic, we were the forerunners. Um, his argument is simply that, um, it's a kind of prophetic conclusion that all of what you're seeing now of all these movements of people from one location to the other uh, is something that Caribbeans had already experienced in different ways. In, this, in his view then, there's always a dark side or the underbelly of contemporary globalization but also for Hall, it is out of that dislocation and displacement that something new emerges. For the Caribbean intellectual, yeah, the geography of the fragmented island or archipelagos and their relation to the sea has been a conduit and repository of histories and become a consistent trope for Caribbean writers. Whether it's Walcott's socio-historical sea and the sea is history, or Benitez Rojo's historical economic sea, or uh, Kamal Bradwitz's dialectics, Oglison's archipelagization. Interesting readings, such as Edwidge Dandicat's Children of the Sea, actually take us on the boat itself, capturing in two voices separation, pain, and loss, the boat about to be engulfed by the Caribbean Sea itself. Okay, finally then, landed the Creole Garden, the private garden, and the colonial botanist, probably more in line with what this uh, conference is, one of this conference's primary themes. Uh, I thought it interesting then to look at the fact that Kincaid says that even as she creates a garden um, and garden book and writes it in 1999, that her garden quote resembled a map of the Caribbean and the sea that surrounded it, surrounded it page seven and eight. And here, even as she details and critiques some aspects of American cultural life, the past intervenes as she compares her present house with the house she grew up in and the assorted punishments associated with Caribbean parenting. KK admits that much as she detested the work and meaning of her mother's Creole garden, it nevertheless has influenced her own private garden. In fact, the entire gardening experience we learn is an attempt to bring riotous Caribbean color into the otherwise winter white and seemingly dead landscapes of Vermont, which is the impetus of Caribbean carnivals of all of the meanings. And she has a really wonderful quote where she said, um, she talks about her garden in the winter, right? Um, and what it looks like and how she longs for that time when the winter white disappears. And she sees it as sort of allied with death and darkness. Uh, so she contrasts the winter garden with color in the Caribbean and a garden in bloom. Um, there's an interesting essay by a young Indian scholar uh, about um, her among flowers, in which he says that in many ways she simultaneously seems to um, although she's abrogating the sort of colonial power to name something, um, in many ways she occupies this place of the privileged world traveler, black first world traveler here, particularly since her travel is funded by National Geographic. Uh, there's another piece um, that makes the argument as well that she occupies a sort of ambiguous role in her colonial, um, kind of colonial role in a way in her travel as she occupies an uncanny space between the familiar role of the gardener, the unfamiliar position of world traveler. And I was reading um, that Among Flowers uh, piece recently to get a sense of where her work was going with that and found that, that contradiction there. But I found as well that she consistently wanted that dislocation. Um, for her then, that dislocation that fe she feels in that journey, and it's, a, it's not a pleasant journey, it's a difficult journey. You can tell from the photographs of herself that, that you can see she loses weight, she looks really bad. Um, but it's a sense of a dislocation that I think she wants. It's a kind of ultimate dislocation which the essay gets at. Um, for her part, Kincaid, and I'm sort of jumping to bring this to conclusion. For her part, Kincaid um, is able to make those same distinctions between herself as a migrating subject uh, and the possibility um, of more than one identity or subject position in operation. So I'm not saying that she's not there. 
occupying that role of the traveler looking on at another group. But it's not a privilege traveling at all. It's not a traveling for entertainment or enjoyment. Um, and she makes that point in a nice interview with Marina Warner. It's a journey which carried a level of pain, including leeches, difficult bridges, unending hiking. And we have again that series of overlapping locations I want to suggest between the kind of Creole garden, private garden that her mother cultivated, the provision grounds that African people in the Americas also cultivated during and following plantation slavery to make a living, and also the final ability of a Caribbean girl to have enough resources to acquire beautiful flowers to visit another location in search of beauty or whatever exists there, the search for the horizon as Hurston also did. All of these desires had been launched then and that imagined, imagined world we began with from at the bottom of the river. Remember she says, I'm looking at this world and I want to go there. Sylvia Winter's interesting discussion on provision grounds indicates that planting and cultivating not for profit but for putting one's markers in the environment provides the basis for the indigenization of Africans into the Caribbean landscape. We can also read Jamaica Kincaid's Vermont Garden as her own expansion of Caribbean space, her own creation of a grounded space, if you will, and with the same impetus as that West Indian weekend that she wrote about, to create a certain chaos and insertion of color in an otherwise bleak and uninviting North American and European landscape. The power imbalance then between the colonial world with the imperative to rename, possess, and control everything, and a Jamaica kinky trying to understand that world has no symmetry. The power, of course, was evident and is still evident in the same system that she has critiqued in the ways that the colonials labeled everything, moved things around, people and plants around the world, created different landscapes for profit and control. And I, I need to say about this question, and I heard it in your talk in the introduction, that I went to, to a conference in Mauritius. And they, one of the places that people love to take you when you go to different places is the botanical garden. And it's actually almost identical to the same ones that I saw as a child in the Caribbean, with the labeling, with the trees, with breadfruits, with, I mean, the British were amazing at uh, this obsessive documenting of every naming and documenting of everything. And not that they didn't, the local people didn't have names. When the uh, English refers to something as pawpaw, it's papaya they're talking about. And they just used, they didn't understand it or they were using the wrong word. But we end up saying pawpaw. What is, there's no pawpaw. That is just British bad languaging of something that indigenous people had already called something else. So their names were already there, as you can tell, from looking at Edwidge Dandicat's Anna Cohen, and many other works. But interestingly, just concluding then, today farm to plate conferences, um, such as one held recently on my, at my campus and in Ithaca, New York, talk about moving, uh, about people doing private gardening. And the logic that is that everybody should have a small private garden of some sort um, in order to increase food security, encouraging gardening for sustenance and survival and beauty in urban locations. But also they comment on the absence of the black gardener who has somehow been lost along the way, even in more progressively liberal communities. Uh, and lost, we know, for all kinds of re neoliberal reasons, the, the increasing of large public farming and so on. So in imperial geographies and Caribbean nationalism, we had argued that anti-colonial agency has for a long time remained the exclusive property of the black male who remained culturally bound to Europe in time and place. For Kincaid, it is always the tension between the drives of encapsulation into small spaces and drives of transcendence, safety, and willful travel, pushing the boundaries of the possible that perme permeate her version of Caribbean discourse. For Kincaid, then, this location and its comforts at every level possible, remain always. I am in a state of constant discomfort, and I like this state so much I would like to share it. But also, how bound up I am to all that is human endeavor, to all that is past, and to all that shall be, and to all that shall be lost, and leave no trace from at the bottom of the river. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. So if you, we're ready, if you are ready to ask questions to Carol, thank you. Thanks a lot for this very stimulating uh, talk. I have something which is not really a real question, but I was interested in the ways in which you developed the concept of the portable self mm -hmm. or the movable self and I was wondering whether that was something that you could that we could relate to this issue of you know crafting um, it's not exactly the same but you developed this idea that wherever you could go you had your little and I th thought it was a very nice uh, image of how you could uh, travel around carrying your portable self <laughs> you know in the little <laughs> suitcase right well I, I mean that I, I'm still troubled by the grafting metaphor, yeah, and I'll tell you why. It's it's part of that sort of colonial um, attempt to constantly create hybrid communities. Actually, we're doing the same things to people. You know that, right? So much so that um, um, in some places in the Caribbean, they, they were able, like Puerto Rico, I know, and... Uh, some of the other Latin American countries to actually talk about 250 different types of Caribbean racial categories. So the grafting metaphor is, is a very colonial metaphor, and I know you're using it as your theme, but it's pretty much creating hybrids in spite of the fact that the theorists like uh, Komi Baba and others jumped onto hybridity. Hybridity is really that creating of a grafted subject. Um, taking people from one place and trying to mix them up and create different categories. Um, much of the botanical experimentation done by the colonials were done not only on the fruits and the plants, but on our bodies. So for me, it's a metaphor that even though it's used, you're using it botanically, and I'm sorry I missed the exhibition yesterday, it's part of the way in which Caribbean subjects ended up being so completely dislocated and created, moved around the world and so on, um, from place to place. That's the other thing that we missed too. A lot of the migrations were taking place all during slavery. They, they would move their enslaved peoples from one location to the next, from Haiti to, to um, South Carolina, based on plantation need and so on. So we end up being sort of very mobile, portable subjects. That's what I mm -hmm. meant by that, really, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the self that is created is for the Caribbean is never a really fixed self, but one that is ready to be mobile. But it's, it's not willfully so. This was ushered in by a series of processes. But then layer that back on to the fact that historically we have long movements across the, in the continent as well. So basically, human beings, um, you know, as we know from, from all of the current historical research, um, you know, begin in certain places, but they're always moving in search of other locations, better areas to grow food, looking for, um, you know, various other forms of being in the world. Um, and those are voluntary, but then you have the enforced horrible ones that we were laughing about. Um, in Ikari's question of numbers, you know, the whole debate mm -hmm. about how many people actually move from Africa to the Caribbean. The, at the Dong scale, it's about 13 million. Um, um, the highest, you know, people use all kinds of figures. But according to Nikari, whatever numbers you use, it's enough <laughs> to, to really get at the whole question of what happened in the forced transatlantic migration. But then I mentioned Mauritius, but then look at what happens on the other side. You also have that movement in Indian Ocean, creating those diasporas on the other side, which we often don't talk about. So I'm looking at the whole question then as a series of different types of movement, willfully, playfully in the Kincaid case. She is looking at other worlds. I don't see it as a colonial operation for her at all. I see it as an attempt for her to sort of activate that, that Caribbean, um, other side of that Caribbean um, logic of, of a globalized space and refusing to be consigned to small spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, okay. Kathleen. Yeah. You were first, go, yeah, go, go ahead. Okay, um, when we're talking about body, um, I'm from Trinidad and I wrote my CXE the 
Annie John is a part of our curriculum. I was also a very um, conservative girls school, which I think most schools are in the Caribbean, just very conservative and uniformed and sometimes um, separated by gender. And, um, and we read Annie John and um, White Sargassi around the same time. Oh, and in both books, um, the, the, the figure uh, leaves the Caribbean at the end. And there's also, in both books, weirdly, um, this scene, uh, or this, this relationship with a young girl, with another girl, um, in, in White Sargassi Sea, it ended, it culminated in the, the stoning of, um, uh, of Bertha by her friend, her friend through a stone. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I can't remember what happened with the red girl uh, in Annie John, because we hated Annie John. It made us very uncomfortable. Um, but we had to read it over and over. And why would um, you say why you hate it? I think it, it's because it made us aware of our own bodies. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, and I myself found no place in it. I, I found I was Annie until I realized Annie was a black girl. Um, Annie had distinguished herself from from the red girl, so I knew I wasn't a red girl. Um, and we have that in my school. We have everything in Trinidad. We have every possible mix. And um, and I think it's significant and also weird. I think it's a, a, um, that these that her, that Annie John is in the CXC curriculum um, because we're so conservative, and it's, it's a very sensuous book. And I think that's why um, we didn't like it, but it's also why it was important that we had it. And I've been, um, I think you might know Evelyn O'Callaghan yeah. from now. Um, she wrote. I, wrote, I read one essay of hers where she. Even at university level, we're still uncomfortable uh, in the Caribbean with uh, with sex or just um, with being open or uh, being independent or demanding as a woman. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's why. Um, so yeah. I don't. I haven't actually known that Jamaica Kincaid was a big deal. I thought, you know, <laughs> until until I, I got this email from Nadia Sessi. Wow, um, that's good to hear. That you know, that. Well, let me let me just say a couple things about that. You know, when I um I I I had wonderful experience as a young scholar, and that is um I got a Commonwealth scholarship from the Trinidad government to do African literature in Nigeria. So I did. I mean, not that I look back. I don't think there's any such thing again. Um, so I studied African literature at a time when um, you could actually see writers coming through the campus, all of them, Cyprini Quincy, Willie Schenker, everybody. Um, so I had an amazing experience, I think, as a young student. But I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C., and also saw everybody, John O'Killens, um, Haki Marubuti, Leon Damas was my thesis advisor of the famous Negritude. Um, and I still have wonderful memories of him, Kathleen. So I think I come out of an experience which allowed me to appreciate black writers from the get-go, which in the Caribbean you didn't get because you were getting the colonial education. So that's why you ended up liking White Sagasse first. Now, the reason why I'm saying <laughs> better than you did, Annie John. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is that when I returned to Trinidad, the first uh, position I held because the government sort of assigns you any job, was teaching at the teacher's college, uh, government teacher's college, which is now part of University of Trinidad and Tobago. However, the curriculum then had no African or Caribbean literature. So you are lucky, I'm just saying, that they actually gave you a Caribbean book to read. Oh my goodness. I didn't recognize her name as a big author, just as a, as a yeah. book that I resented Right. No, we had to fight to get one book in, and, and to get you to get CSC, Caribbean books on CSC was a struggle. Exactly. So putting Jamaica kink in and making sure people like you read it is precisely what they wanted so that you could be here saying that you did that. So I'm happy <laughs> that happened for you. Yeah, I did have the impression that someone was looking out for us, yeah. otherwise we would have gotten a completely colonial education. Exactly. So, I'm glad so that's what, that was, um, I'm just saying that 
in, in spite of the fact that you have independence for the Caribbean in the 1960s, I, we're still decolonizing, you know. We still, <laughs> even in the US, they're still taking on statues of Confederate racist generals and people are protesting and burning torches and so on. In the Caribbean, it's not unusual to still, I think in Trinidad, recently they're still at Columbus in the square somewhere downtown. And I keep saying, how come nobody has knocked that down yet? And the reason why I say that, I went to Angola last year with UNESCO, and in the war museum, the Angolans have captured all those statues. They, they, they didn't destroy them, but they in the war museum as captured objects. That's where they should be. But essentially, um, and then once you get into the museum, you see their stuff. You see Nzinga, you see Ojinga, you see the range of things they have had to experience to get free. But in the Caribbean, your point about conservative is also an interesting point. Let me just touch on that. Simply, I think the Caribbean has that contrast all the time. You have amazing public sexuality, the way that the women dance on the street. Um, and then on the, on, on the other, you have this sort of enforced, um, old-fashioned British morality of uniforms and so on, which I still like, because it, you know, it cuts down on all the other stuff. But somebody just sent me a, a video of the little girls in uniforms. Yeah, they, I mean, so basically worse than that. We'll talk afterwards or what, what I saw. But basically, the Caribbean always presents a sort of dual, that duality. On the one hand, sort of public demonstrations of sexuality and sensuality, but on the other, certain cultural codes that are still enforced that are very morally Christian, religious, or Muslim-based and, and very um, enforced, um, you know, covering and so on. In fact, now you have people in burqa in Trinidad, in black burqas. Like, why? In, in my Presbyterian school in the burqa, we were fine. Yeah, but but it's it's a new. That's a new development. That was. I mean, the woman, the Indian woman, wore orany and so on. But you didn't have this completely covered. Uh, woman in the Caribbean in that heat, so it, that's a new, new development. Oh yeah, for sure. Kathleen, mm -hmm. thank you. So Wait, oh, okay, I, I'm sorry. What, Kathleen, that's what I said. Yeah, I did. That's what I, I was thank saying. Thank you so much for your yeah. mm -hmm. nice comments. I, I just like quickly two remarks. In fact, uh, talking about okay, combinations yeah. of ethnicities, um, we have also the Caribbean as untranslatable talking with Amin Asper, and in French, Mobo de Saint-Méry gives the name une greffe, mm -hmm. greffe to one of the 126 combinations. Ah. So this is really another signification of the word graft. grafting and, yes, but to the bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's a quarteron who makes a child with a white man, and that becomes an octavon, quatre, or griffe. Mm. So griffe exists in French, uh, the old mm -hmm. French of Saint-Domingue. Mm -hmm. Grafting, actually, of the body. And yeah. I did the same botanical garden in Mauritius, and what I found surprising ah. was that it still is named Pamplemousse. So the French, in spite of the English having this obsession with labeling all the botanical species, we have Pamplemousse. Mm -hmm. And when I was asking the guy, how come that the labels are in, in Creole sometimes also, or in English, the title of the, tota, the botanical garden is Pamplemousse. So I think that's very meaningful of some um, of which is being a place where three languages quite harmoniously coexist. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wanted to add Absolutely. That. And then also the Creole culture, yes. definitely. back to mm -hmm. the untranslatable, yes. Uh, in French, we have this whole vocabulary of métis, métissa, mm -hmm. and precisely the must refuse that. So in his poetry, you will never find métis, he never uses it because it makes no like poking cake, it's just comforting. So it doesn't want to use it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Someone has more questions in the back? Oh, Miriam. Mm -hmm. I think I can project my voice. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, while you were talking, I was thinking about this early essay that, that you wrote about. Um, cannibalized bodies, yeah. making space, making space, which is to me very relevant to the discussion. Um, but my question is about um, this obsession with space, the, the fact that um, we have all this instability and rejection of linearity as well as uh, rejection of boundaries in general, 
Would you say, I mean, to what extent would you say that to women writers, considering the body, and I'm thinking about Denticate that you quoted as well uh, as others, considering the fragmentation of the body, the specific positioning of the body into space, and perhaps as well the grafting of space when we think about the expansion of space, of Caribbean space that you discussed as well. I wondered what would be your um, opinion about, I mean, what, what would you say about the difference between men and women? Because this is a question that I'm often asked. Uh, would you say that women writers, uh, do, do they position themselves into space? differently and to what extent, specifically with diasporic women writers. Wow, that's a, a great research project <laughs> <laughs> to look at. <laughs> it's a great project to look at how both men and women use space. I, I think the, you know, the first distinction one can make right away is that the, for that group of male writers, and if, I mean, just think Walker, just think all of the others. Um, it's a very specific, and Fanon captures it best, actually. It's a very specific relation of the colonial male to the white. He says the white man. Look at Fanon there at the top. You know, dislocated and able to be abroad with the other, the white man who had mercifully imprisoned me. So it's a relation, spatial relationship um, that is to the colonial, um, the dominant colonial power in this particular case, as embodied in the white male. Um, and I, I see the woman writer, um, whether you're talking Jean Reese or whoever, trying to really push back against that by looking at the self in relation to the mother or to the other, or even critically, in spite of the fact that it may be critical, as, as Daryl Dance's work will show, um, of that maternal uh, relationship. But it's a, a pushing against that and looking for a wider, a wider place to be in the world as Kinke does. So, but I think it would be fascinating to look at relationally at, at, at what each of the writers has done with that question. Um, I, I see Walcott even still um, looking at the question of fragmentation and if his Nobel address is interesting for that because he's still talking about fragmented spaces but how we put together those pieces again and then for Glissant, of course, archipelagization, the sort of repetition through different dialects. or Benitez wrote the same thing from the other side. Um, uh, with Kincaid, I, I think if we start looking at the writers themselves for what was, isn't within the text for talking about those questions, Kincaid is a good example because she begins at the bottom uh, with her first book to look at myself in space, you know, look at me here, um, you know, in, in, in Caribbean space, what is it, you know, how it moves, how do I move through it? Um, and I, I, I guess that's all I can say right now about that, but that's a great, great question, Miriam. I can see you working your mind <laughs> going in those kinds of directions. Any other one, or are we good? No, I think that we are running the out time. Of time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you, Carol. Thank, thank you. you very much.